Welcome back everyone. So let's continue my Harry Potter film reviews with Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, the fifth Harry Potter book and film. And like the like the Goblet of Fire and like Half-Blood Prince, four, five, and six, those books in terms of being adapted to film are different. Like the these really aren't aren't as faithful. So this one, like Goblet of Fire, has a lot of omissions to it. Like, for example, there's no Quidditch in this movie at all, and Quidditch was a big factor in the book, and there's no Dobby or Winky again. Um, there's a lot of moments where, like, a lot of things are just, like, condensed in this movie, like Goblet of Fire. Like, for example, whenever Harry has occupancy lessons with Snape, there's a lot more of that in the book. Um, they go to... Whenever uh, Arthur Weasley is attacked by Nagini, they go to the hospital that he's at, and they even meet Gilroy Lockhart, and they even see Neville with his parents, who are um, who have been driven insane by Bellatrix Lestrange with the Cruciatus Curse. So you see them in the book, and they are tortured and gone, like they are just out of their mind. And I really wish that they could have done that in this movie. It's unfortunate that they had a lot of things cut. Because, like, for example, the Quidditch, scene, the Quidditch scenes would have actually helped Ron as a character more. Because it really did in the book, but it's unfortunate. But, as is, despite this not being as faithful to the novel like Goblet of Fire and Half-Blood Prince, this one is still an incredible movie. I still get blown away by this movie, even though they do condense everything down and take away a lot of stuff. This one is, honestly, like, every movie I'm watching... Rewatching, it they just keep getting better and better, and I really love this one, and I love Harry's plight. I love everything about this movie and about the characters, everything about it, just like the other movies. And I have a lot to talk about this one, so strap in. Um, funny enough, how I talked about how this was adapted from the novel. The novel is the longest book in the in the book series, but this is the shortest movie, if you don't count Deadly Hallows Part 2, which is a part two of a one movie, so I say this counts as the shortest movie. And it's under two and a half hours, which is really interesting that they got that, they condensed this so much, and they did it so well, even though there's things that I wish were in this movie, they condensed this down so incredibly well, where I was just surprised how fluid and how great this movie works. Like, this works on a very incredible level, despite cutting a lot of stuff. Very, a lot of emissions, like Goblet of Fire. But, uh, but I love how it starts out with how Harry is at this abandoned, um, little abandoned, like, swing set, and, like, he's just sitting there, like, really sad because of what happened with Cedric in the last movie, because whenever Cedric died. And then... Dudley comes up. Oh, and the the Dursleys appear again in this one. They didn't appear in Goblet of Fire because they had so much to put in that movie. They omitted them. But in this one, the Dursleys appear again, and Harry, sitting on that lonely uh, swing set, Dobby comes up with his friends and bully Harry about how he has these nightmares about Cedric. Like, don't kill Cedric. And then Dudley even says, who's Cedric, a boyfriend? And then he'd say, like, the stuff Harry's says in his dreams, like, he's going to kill me, Mom. And then Dudley, horrible. He gets he gets worse every movie. Like, he's horrible um, in a great way. Like, he's an actor who's, like, this actor who plays Dudley is really unlikable, but that makes him a good actor, though. But this, but whenever he says to Harry, like, where is your mom? Where is your mom, Potter? Is she dead? Is she dead? And then she and, then he and, he and the and all of his friends just start laughing about it, like that they're making fun of Harry's dead mother. Like, fuck you, Dudley. That's horrible. But, again, this actor who plays Dudley is really good. Like, I think that he plays a horrible person well, if that is a compliment to him. I think it is, because it's a great performance. Um, but I like how it starts out with Harry just grieving over Cedric being gone, and, like, Voldemort is back. Like, he is fully back. Harry encountered him. And then, right when this happens, Harry puts out his wand towards Dudley. Uh, after all this rage, like, he goes up to Dudley and put his, puts his wand up to Dudley's throat, and then his friends laugh, laugh and think it's just a joke, too, but Dudley knows it's real. Like, he can use magic on him. And 
then everything goes cold, like the dark, like it becomes dark, and then the Dementors start coming, where Harry and Dudley hide under this bridge, and Dudley, of course, is a muggle, so he can't see Dementors, but Harry can, and Harry sees two of them appear, um, and Harry lights this, lights the Patronus charm, while Dudley gets his soul partially sucked out, but I mean, he doesn't, like, it doesn't fully get sucked out, he just kind of gets loopy and gets delirious. But Harry, of course, uses the Patronus charm and gets both the Muggles sent away. Uh, or, not the Muggles, the Dementors sent away. So, we have that great action scene starting out. Like, that's cool how it starts out with an action scene. And it's short, but it's really well done. Um, and then, whenever they go home, like, Vernon and Petunia are both freaking out because they're like, you made our kid go crazy. Like, he's absolutely loopy now. Um... And Dudley even pointed at Harry like he did it. So it's like, and it makes sense because even if Dudley's a dick, he didn't see the Dementors in the first place. But I just thought that was a really, like, I like how it starts out with that in this in the book and in the movie where he just has to, uh, he has to fight off Dementors in the little whinging, this area where muggles are live. And it's like, you wouldn't have Dementors there. Somebody must have sent those muggles, or had sent those Dementors. Which, this is another thing that did bug me in the movie, is they don't explain who sent the Dementors, which was Umbridge. So, but, uh, but I, I do love this, those scenes, though. They're great. It's a great action scene, and I like how whenever, before, actually, before Harry goes back, he meets Mrs. Fig, who, in the book, it's described as a squib, which is a non-magical human, or a non-magical person born from a magical family. So she has no magic. She's just born without it. Uh, like a muggle, but she's not a muggle because she was born from a magic family. So, so I really liked that, and I liked how these, I don't know, I really thought that was good. And Harry starts out to where, whenever he gets home, after he talks to Mrs. Fig about how Dumbledore's been keeping guard over him since he left, or I mean since Cedric died and since he left school from the, his fourth year, Mrs. Fig, of course, said that somebody's been watching you, like, keeping an eye on you. Why would Dumbledore leave you out on your own with Voldemort back and with Cedric Diggory getting killed? So, Harry, like, Mrs. Fig has been watching over him. So, I like that. I like that Dumbledore is still keeping track of everybody, no matter what. But, Harry goes home to the Dursleys and is expelled from Hogwarts immediately because he used magic. Um, even though in Prisoner of Azkaban, he blew up his aunt into a balloon and, like, she floated away, but then, then he didn't care. Fudge didn't care in that moment, but now he cares because their Dumbledore and Harry are spreading the room, spreading the truth that Voldemort is back, but Fudge, the Minister of Magic, is denying it, afraid that this will cause chaos for everybody if they, and he thinks that they're lying and he's under the delusion that they are, that Harry and, uh, Dumbledore are lying about Dumbledore returning. Or, I mean, Voldemort returning. And I really, really like that. I like how this story starts out with that, where everybody's in denial about the Dark Lord appearing again. Like, he is back. He is fully going to become back and ready to take over. So, of course, people are going to be in denial of that. So, I like that a lot. And I like how, after that, Harry gets taken, like, like he's just at home while... The Dursleys go and, like, try to fix Dudley. Like, try to find a place for him to go and fix his loopiness. And they and Harry is taken away by the who is revealed to be the Order of the Phoenix, Mad-Eye Moody, and all these other people that he's never met before, like Tonks, Kingsley, and a couple other people that I don't remember the names of. But they're part of the Order of the Phoenix. And they take him after a broom ride through, through London. They take him to Grimmauld Place, which is the headquarters of the Order of the Phoenix, where they Hermione and Ron explain that to him as whenever they get whenever he gets there, they explain that. And I like how Ron and Hermione have the reunion with Harry, but I love the fact that Harry immediately says like like you have been, you've been keeping busy, I presume, to them and the, and they said, "Yeah, why?" And he's and he says like, "I haven't got a scrap of mail all all summer." Like, nobody's kept me in on anything. And then I love the fact that Hermione just straight up says it's because Dumbledore told us not to. 
and that makes suspicion on what is up with Dumbledore. Like, is like why is Dumbledore ignoring Harry? And it will be explained later in the movie. But I love the fact that it's the first hint of Dumbledore ignoring Harry and trying to not be near him throughout the school year. Like, this is the year where Dumbledore is really hidden from Harry. So, I, lo I really like their reunion and how it's a bittersweet one because he thinks that they were betraying him but then realized Dumbledore is betraying him. Betraying him in a way, you know. Like, you'll see what the... Whenever I talk about the ending, you'll know. But, or if you've seen the movie, you know, you obviously have probably if you're watching the spoiler video, but... But I like the reunion with Sirius Black. I think that's great because in, because there was only one scene in the movie Gabble to Fire where he had a lot more in the book. So it's great seeing Gary Oldman back more. And Gary Oldman is even greater in this movie. Like, he keeps getting better and better. Like, he's so good in this movie. Um, I love that reunion with him and Harry because it's been a while since I've actually literally seen each other in the movies. So that's really great. Um... And then Harry has the hearing to where he might not be expelled, and he goes to the hearing with Arthur Weasley, and Dumbledore is the one on his defense that he tells Fudge, like, that Voldemort is back, listen to reason, and then, then out of a clear set of, like, Dumbledore persuading everybody, he eventually gets it to where Harry isn't expelled, he is back in school. But, again, he ignores Harry. Like, he doesn't look at Harry. He backs away from him. He just talks not at him. And Harry is wondering, what is going on? Why are you doing that? And, again, it's the second time. So I like that it keeps building that in there, that Dumbledore is ignoring him for some reason. Because um, he's cleared of all charges, but then Dumbledore just walks out before Harry could even say anything. So I really like that. And then... We get this great scene I really love whenever Harry and everybody are getting on the train, like they're at the station, and Sirius is there, and Harry talks to Sirius like, Sirius shouldn't be here if anybody sees. And then Sirius says, well, what's life without a real little risk? And I, uh, I really like that it just it shows how great of a relationship they've got because they connect in a way where Sirius this... Azkaban prisoner who's still being searched for, by the way, he's still being searched for all this time, it goes out in public and goes out to Harry to say goodbye to him. Um, so I really think that just shows how great of a friend, uh, great of a relationship they have, him and Sirius. And whenever they go into that little room where Sirius turns from a dog into himself, he gives Harry this picture of the original Order of the Phoenix where it has Harry's parents, it has Wormtail, it has Sirius, it has all these different, uh, and Mad-Eye Moody, all these different members that were there in the original Order of the Phoenix before, whenever this happened with Dumbledore the first time. And he explains, like, about Neville's parents in the picture, too, how they went insane. How he it talks about his Harry's parents and it's just a really touching scene where like again it builds on their relationship Sirius and Harry and it gives just a, it gives such a liking to the sad occurrences that will come later in the movie it just it works really well on building up Harry and Sirius's relationship um that scene is great um so I love that and then I love whenever they get to Hogwarts school they're Harry sees these beasts uh, moving the carriages, and Ron and Hermione don't see them, and then this girl, like, is sitting on one of the carriages and says, you're not going mad, I can see them too. And that character is Luna Lovegood, first introduced in this movie, um, in Neville and Ginny's grade, is this awesome character where she's this very whimsical, <gasps> very light character where, like, she she's she's incredibly weird but so endearing and so likable and Ivana Lynch who plays Luna in this in these movies is really really likable really good a really great performance she's got this way of talking that's very very nice and whimsical and she just she has such a nice personality and she's such a has such a great performance in all these movies and I really love her in this movie and I love how she's the one who tells Harry, like, you, I see them too, like, these things move in the carriages. And it, she just has all these weird moments when they're on the carriage talking to everybody and they don't understand what's going on. Like, it's funny. She's funny too. She's such a funny 
out there character, but she's so likable. And I really enjoy Luna in this movie, and in all the movies, honestly, after this. But I thought she was great. And I love how, even though she was in the hearing, you then get introduced to Dolores Umbridge, who is the one person who, I guess, apparently has been the one to um, talk while Dumbledore is talking the th a speech in front of the school, like he, where he gives the yearly speech, like at the beginning of the year. And Del Dolores Umbridge in uh, interrupts him and has him talk like she talks over him and ignore and ignores everything he was talking about and Dolores Umbridge is in in so many ways the best villain in this franchise she's sometimes even worse than Voldemort where I can't, I cannot hate I cannot stand her in a lot of ways and this performance is really fantastic I love the performance of Dolores Umbridge uh Emilda Staunton or Staunton <coughs> She is really incredible. Very moving. Um, in terms of, like, I hate her. I hate her. I want to, like, wring her neck because this character is just so awful. And she's worse in the books because you get more in the books. But she is really incredible in this movie. Her performance is so hate-inducing. Like, just because she is so good at being this character, this horrible character. Um, this character who Fudge sent in to take over... Um, take over the school because Dumbledore uh, Fudge is scared that Dumbledore wants to take over his job so he brings in the worst person ever literally worse than Voldemort in a lot of ways so I love this villain she is incredible but just in the worst ways and in the best ways I love this character um, so much and we get the first class of Umbridge where she tells them like we're not going to be making spells we're going to just be doing a safe ministry risk free um, studies and everybody's like we're not going to use magic what and then then like she says why would you ever need to use magic in my classroom and then she would say this stuff like why would you ever need to use magic at all like what like and then Harry brings up Voldemort in class, like he stands up to her perfectly, where he's like, she's like, who on earth would hurt little kids like yourselves? And then Harry would sit, Harry says, oh, I don't know, maybe Lord Voldemort. And then she stops and just sits there, taking hesitation to think, what do I say to this? And then she says, now, some of you may have, may have heard that a certain dark lord is now brought back again and this is a lie and then Harry says it's not a lie I saw him I fought him and then she just screams like detention and then like he says so do you think Cedric Diggory died or just died uh, like like he completely just died of different causes uh, whenever Voldemort killed him and she says Cedric Diggory's death was an awful thing and then like trying to push away from the subject and then Harry just says no it was murder Voldemort killed him and then she just screams enough enough and just sits there and then she takes Harry out to detention where he writes on a quill I must not tell lies but the thing is that this person is so fucking awful where what she does is the the quill that she gives Harry to write literally ingra like drains blood from him so it ingrains the I must not tell lies on his arm on like on his hand it literally, she, he literally loses blood to write this quote, or this line, many, many times, I must not tell lies. And it just pisses me off, but it's so great, because then Harry, after he writes the line first and sees it's in his wrist, like, it's ingrained, he looks up at her and she just says, yes. And then he just says nothing, and then she goes, good. Because I know that you know deep down that you deserve to be punished. And he he doesn't say anything, but he is just pissed and losing it. Like, because then Harry starts having these nightmares about Voldemort. Like, he, he gets so much... Since Voldemort came back, he starts having nightmares about Voldemort. And, like, he's doing these awful things. Like, he's becoming Voldemort. And I really like that about this movie, too. That it makes him... It makes Harry have a kind of dark side temptation thing like Star Wars where it's like he's going over the edge to the dark side in a way where like the villain is is 
messing with his mind. And Voldemort, it's really cool how he does it in this movie and in the book. Like, I really like how he messes with Harry in a way where since he's back, he can literally, and literally mess with Harry from the inside. So I think that's great. Um, and I like after that, we get this scene where we get back to Luna again, which is a great scene where Luna sees Harry and she's like feeding those things and Harry's uh, Harry looks at her and she explains that these are Thestrals. These are only you are only able to see these because you have seen death and because Harry saw his parents die and Luna who explains she saw her mother or die through a bad experiment mishap she died. So I really like that scene that like Luna is the one to bring Harry like like she it does a good job of having her be kind of his person to lean on in a way in a lot of ways in this movie like she's just such a great character and she gives such a way of making this like she's it's exposition but in a way where it's such interesting exposition and where she's telling Harry this stuff but she's just so likable and so charming so I really like that um so we get a lot of great moments with these characters especially with Harry and Luna and then, as this goes along, Umbridge takes over the school. Literally, she takes over everything. Um, there's a great scene where, a series of scenes, um, like where she's talking and messing with every teacher, where, like, Professor Trelawney, where, like, she, um, Umbridge just says to her, can you give me a, uh, God, I don't know what the word is, like, uh, God, I don't know why I'm blanking, but the word to where, like, like, she's, do you see something? Like, do you see something in the ball? And Trelawney's like, I'm sorry? Like, like trying to tell, like, trying to get Trelawney to, to have a vision of something without seeing anything, uh, with just asking about it. And then a scene where she's talking to Snape, and she's like, so you were trying to be a Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher, Yes. Uh, yeah, and Snape just goes, yes, and then she says, but you failed, and he says, obviously, like, he's just pissed about it, um, because he's always wanted the Defense Against the Dark Arts job, and she got it, and then she started taking over the school, and then she, like, measures Flit, uh, the music teacher, I don't, it's not Flitwick, but it's the other one, um, the music teacher that's really, that's a, sh that's a dwarf, a literal dwarf, she measures him while he's playing, like, he's, conducting a p group of people like he's conducting people while she measures him for measuring his size like she's trying to find anything out of any of these teachers just to sack them and get rid of them um and i like how Tr professor trilony is literally let go um or there's a great scene where she's like crying out out in the out in this area and every kid is watching her and she says to Umbridge, like, you can't do this. Like, I've been here for 14 years. Hogwarts is my home. And Umbridge, like, banishes her. And then, but then Dumbledore comes in and says that you have no right to, um, you have no right to take away one of my teachers. Like, you can, you can't banish them from the grounds. That lies with the headmaster. And then Umbridge just says, for now. And just the way she talks is just so hate inducing like she she knows everything she's up to and it's horrible because she's gonna get that position she's going farther down or farther up this pedestal at hogwarts because she's part of the ministry she can do anything she wants now and that's scary and especially with this character and with this horrible personality um and 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 like i like how sirius explains later like in the scene at the fire like from Goblet of Fire, like whenever he's, his face is in the fire again, he's scared. He's saying that Fudge is scared Dumbledore will take his job, and and that he's building up an army to take over the Ministry, which Harry and Ron and Hermione understand and think is ridiculous because it is. Um, but then I love how that introduces us to have them start their army to start Dumbledore's army. Um, they even named themselves Dumbledore's Army, Harry, Hermione, and Ron, and everybody else who joins. But they meet in seclusion and have this great scene where everybody's there, huddled around in, I forgot what the pub is called, but it's at the Hogsmeade where Aberforth Dumbledore, Dumbledore um, uh, Albus Dumbledore's brother, like his pub, 
um, is it like, is it the Hogshead? I think it's the Hogshead. But they're at the Hogshead, and they're meeting in seclusion, talking about, like, joining this army, like, literally going to start training. And I love how Harry has such a great line where he's saying to everybody about who wants to join this army, he, he says, like, like, sorry to disappoint you guys, but every time I've had something big, like, it's been luck. I've usually always had help, and it's, like, I don't, I was just lucky most of the time. And his line where he says, facing stuff in real life is not the same as school. In school, you can, if you mess up, you can do it the next day. In real life, when you're a second away from death, you don't know what that's like. Um... And I, I love that line. And then they've got everybody just explain, like, talks to him like, like, they're going to do it. Like, they're going to join regardless of, like, if it causes death or accidents. Like, they're going to fight for this school, like, because of what Umbridge is doing. They're going to fight for Dumbledore. They're going to fight for everything. They're going to fight because Voldemort is back. And people are starting to believe Harry now, even though the Ministry in the Daily Prophet is saying that Dumbledore and Harry are liars. So, I love that scene where they first all meet together, all the, everybody, like all the people who want to join Dumbledore's army. It's a great moment. Um, and Harry even mentions that it could be for Cedric, like, because Cedric died during this last thing. And, like, it's really just a heartwarming scene where, like, they join together and are going to actually go and fight against this evil. Um... In more ways than one, more more evils than one, I guess, if that makes any sense. But uh, but Neville in this film finds the room of retire room of requirements. I almost said room of retirement, but room of requirements, where this is a room that is only created to where if the person wills it, they'll get what they want in this room. It require it gets what they're required. So. Neville finds this room a requirement, and it can turn into anything. Like, it could change to where people on the inside can change it to where nobody can find it on the outside. Um, Neville finds it, and they have this. They have all these training montages, which are really great, where it, it does a good job of showing how these characters are not very, like, in terms of, like, bigger magic spells that, like, they haven't done yet, like Harry doing the Patronus Charm, teaching everybody that. Um, all these different spells, it shows for a while that these characters have to take a while to get it. Like, it, it, this montage, it shows them, like, failing, um, especially Neville, and then they get, they all start learning these spells really greatly. And while they do that, it has uh, Filch and, like, Malfoy and Crabbe and Goyle and all these people trying to find where the room requirement is because Umbridge already knows. But I love how that's the sequences of that happening while they're training. Like, that's really cool. Um, and I love the scene where, with Cho Chang, after they did all the training and they're all doing a good job, there's this great scene with Cho, who loved Cedric from the last movie and went to the Yule Ball with him. In this one, Harry goes up to Cho, who's crying over um, a picture of Cedric, and, like, Umbridge has been interrogating everybody to find out where this secret... Um, room is like that she knows it's going on like there's a secret room where they're learning magic she just understands that so Harry says to her uh, to Cho like I heard Umbridge gave you a hard time a couple days ago and, sh and Cho's like yeah I'm fine and she's cr just crying and she says like but it's worth it and then it, cho it cuts to a shot of the picture of Cedric just smiling there and it just it gives me chills because it's like it it makes these characters so like you care so much for him and they lost this character that like it was only in one movie but it's just he makes such an impact in the next movie in this one and I love how that makes Cho and Harry um kiss and I liked how they had their their first kiss together and it was just a really nice sweet thing that happened with these characters so I really like that a lot um and it just was a really good good moment and so after that it's basically like they've been training at the room requirement and then Harry starts having more and more dreams like he gets more and more 
or more and more nightmares, like he's going even more crazier because now he had a dream where he was Nagini, Dumbledore's, or I mean, a Voldemort snake. And Voldemort Snake Nagini goes in the ministry, attacks Arthur Weasley from Harry's point of view. He's the snake, like literally biting Arthur Weasley. And then Harry wakes up, freaks out. All the Weasleys go down with him to Dumbledore's office with McGonagall. And Dumbledore is still backing away from Harry, keeping it, not keeping a look at him, like turning around, not looking at Harry, asking like, where were you in the dream? What were you doing? Blah, blah, blah. And as this is going on, Harry's trying to t talk to Dumbledore, like, what is going on? Am I all right? Like, what, what can I do? And then as Dumbledore just won't answer him, Harry just screams, look at me! And then Dumbledore does look at him. And then he just sits there, like, Harry just sits there like, what's happening to me? And then that's the first moment in the movie so far that Dumbledore and Harry have actually had a look at each other and had a con kind of a conversation. And Dumbledore brings in Snape, who starts treat, uh, starts teaching Harry occlumency, which is where you keep your mind protected from evil. Like Voldemort, who Snape explains in the first lesson of occlumency in this movie, that Dumbledore, that Voldemort, he uh, always did this when he was at large. Like he would trap people's people inside their minds and mess with them and make them go insane. So. He starts to train Harry on protection, even though Harry isn't is too high strung, freaking out about this. So it's not going very well with him and Snape. And Snape and him already have this vicious relationship, anyways. So it's the worst person to choose to train Harry. So Harry now is suffering all these things. Like he suffers so many things in this movie, and it's it really builds up on his character. Um, so I really love that a lot. And. Then we get to Christmas at Grimmauld Place, where, like, Arthur Weasley is fine. Like, he's got out of the hospital. Um, because they don't have the hospital scenes in this movie, but they, they go to Grimmauld Place, and he's fine. He's out of the hospital, and now, like, Harry is thankful that Arthur's alive, but he knew that he did it. Like, he was the snake's point of view. Like, he killed him. Or, I mean, not killed him, but he, he injured him really bad to where he could have killed him. So... I really love that, how, like, Harry just, even though he looks at Arthur like he's happy, you know in, in his mind, like, I could have killed him, like, doing this in my nightmare. So, that's really great, too. Um, and then we get a great scene, a fantastic scene, honestly, of S Harry and Sirius, where they are talk they are talking about Sirius's family tree, um, and after seeing Creature again, like, uh, the house elf that's there. And Sirius explains how long he had a creature, and then he explains the family tree, and he shows the Lestranges, and he shows Bellatrix Lestrange, Helena Bonham Carter in the picture. But, uh, but he says how he hated a lot of his whole family, like, that wasn't his parents, like, he hated his outer family, like, they were all horrible. Um, and then I love, th this is probably my favorite scene in the whole movie, I love this moment, it's such an emotional moment, such a chilling moment where it perfectly encapsulates how Harry and Sirius' relationship is in this movie, and in general, in the, in the films. But Harry says to Sirius, after he's had these nightmares, he's like, do you think after all this time, for some reason, maybe I'm going bad, maybe I'm going, maybe I'm turning evil, like, what's wrong with me? And then Sirius says, to, like, he, like, he's, like Harry says, maybe I'm a bad person, or becoming a bad person. And then I love this line from Sirius, and this is one of my favorite lines in the whole franchise, where he says to Harry, you are not a bad person. You are a very good person who bad things have happened to. Um, besides, the world isn't split between good people and Death Eaters. There's both light and dark inside of everybody. What matters is the part we act on. And it's just a really emotional moment, and it really works well. Um... And then he says to him, like, whenever Hermione and Ron tell him, like, we gotta go, Sirius says to Harry, when this is all over, we'll be a proper family. And it just, again, just is so great in how they build up this relationship and tear it away at the end. But, man, like, it's just so good. Um, 
And then I like how it inter it introduces Haggard to this movie, which is halfway through the movie, but the book was like that too, where Haggard wasn't in for a long time. But then Haggard explains to Harry Ron and Hermione that he's been trying to talk to the um to the giants who since Voldemort is now at large again, even though nobody wants to believe it, he is getting people on his side. And Haggard went to the Giants to try to convince him to join Dumbledore's side because he knew that Voldemort could get these Giants. So that's why he's been gone the whole movie. And I like that explanation. I like that that didn't make it a cop-out that Haggard wasn't in it much. Like, I thought that was really good. Um, and then they go and meet Grop, which is Haggard's half-brother, who is three times the size of Haggard or any human. And Haggard's a giant, um, giant person anyways. So... I really like that a lot. Um, and then after that, it's it's where I, how I explained that Bellatrix was strange and how she was in the family tree picture. Um, this is when Voldemort breaks everybody out of Azkaban prison, all the Death Eaters. And then Fudge makes it to where he thinks that Sirius Black is the one behind all of this madness. Like, like since Sirius Black broke out of Azkaban before, how could he maybe, he could have maybe did that now and broken out all these Death Eaters. So Sirius Black is even looking worse to the public eye than ever. So it's horrible that he keeps getting so so shit on Sirius Black as he's literally been blamed for the murder of or like taking like taking the information of Voldemort for Harry's parents and killing them, but his Pettigrew, but everybody thinks it was him. And then now it looks like he's the one who broke out every Death Eater. So like Sirius is never gonna have a right life after this situation, so it's horrible. And, uh, like I said, all the Death Eaters escape from Azkaban, and Bellatrix or Strange escapes. Of course, it shows her, uh, being, being broken out. Um, and then it's perfect, because then it cuts to after training again, in the rumor requirement, where Neville is talking to Harry, looking at that picture that Harry got from Sirius about with the old Order of the Phoenix, with, with Neville's parents, and telling Harry, like, my parents were tortured by... Bellatrix, Bellatrix Lestrange, but they never gave in. They they were tortured until they went mad. And it was just a great character moment for Neville, and I love how Harry says, we'll make them, ha we'll make them happy, Neville. Like, I just, it really was a great moment where these characters... Again, it makes Neville a great character, and it makes Harry just even more of a great character. Um, it's just so sad that Neville's parents encountered that, that torture, and then Neville dealt with all of this too, like having no parents that were normal, like he lives with his grandma, like, or he lived with his grandma ever since, so it's just an awful thing that happened to him for all this stuff, like he's being made fun of the whole, like throughout the first couple of movies, he was a dork, he was made fun of, and then you realize how horrible of a life he has, it's just really sad. Um, and then it, this is the point where in the movie, Umbridge finds the rumor requirement, breaks them out. With every with like Filch and Malfoy and Crabbe and Goyle and all them, and Cho told on them, um, even though you realize later that it's the Veritaserum, which is the truth potion that Umbridge gave to Cho, so Cho told the truth, um, unwillingly, so or willingly with the po with the Veritaserum, but Cho's the one who told on them. So now, this is where Dumbledore is talking to. Fudge and everybody and Umbridge and saying like like he did all this like this is Dumbledore's army it's called Dumbledore's army I made this army and Fudge is like you were going to take over the take over my job and then uh, Dumbledore just says immediately yeah that's what I was going to do even though this is nothing that Dumbledore wanted he just is saying this to please Fudge um, and Fudge says well he's going to Azkaban prison and then Dumbledore says I have no intent on going to Azkaban prison and then Fox the Phoenix comes in, grabs Dumbledore, and then he, f then like they touch, and like fire flies out to where they both escape. So Dumbledore is hidden from now forever now. Like he, nobody knows where he's at. And I love that great line where Kingsley Shacklebolt's talking to Fudge after Dumbledore escapes, um, and he says, "You may not like a minister, but you cannot deny that he has." Uh, that he has style. He has such great style. And it's just such a funny scene because that Kingsley character, even though he's not in this as much as the books, he was he had such a great line. I love that line. Um, 
and I really like that a lot. That's really good. Um, and then we get to this awesome scene, actually one of my favorite scenes as well, where Snape is trying to do the occlumency lesson to Harry again, trying to shield his mind. And now Harry reverses it to where he sees in Snape's mind, because Snape's been showing, looking at Harry's mind and his memories, it shows in Snape's mind where you see Snape, young Snape, being tortured by Harry's dad, being made fun of, having Snape crying in a corner like it 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 gives such a small inkling about how great how this character whenever you realize in the last one what his true intent is but it just shows how much he resents Harry because he he's so much like his father he looks like his father he acts like his father even though he's not a bully to Snape he's the same kind of thing like his father and that scene of him seeing his dad uh, Harry seeing his dad torture Snape, like Harry, like Snape just grabs Harry after he sees the memory of that, like literally grabs him by the shirt like this and just Harry says like I'm sorry I didn't, and then Snape just says your lessons are over, and then Harry just says I'm sorry, and then Snape just says get out, and Harry just leaves, and Snape just sits there, like he doesn't move, like he doesn't know what to think now that Harry knows that. He was bullied and made fun of his whole lot. I mean, the whole school with like Harry's father. Like Harry's father was a bully to him, so it changes Harry and Snape's perspective on what they are um, in these movies as it goes along. Like this is the first inkling of like, oh, this is horrible. That like this is what really is going on with how Snape presents Harry, even though you don't get the full story yet. But it works really well, um, and. So I really love that. And after after this is where basically Fred and George break out like break out of Hogwarts school, wreak havoc on Umbridge. Um and then Harry has a vision that Sirius is being tortured by Voldemort and Sirius says, You'll have to kill me. And then Voldemort says, Oh I will, but I'll but I'm gonna torture you first, and then you just see him using the Cruciatus curse on Sirius and just screaming like he's in pain. And Harry falls down under this big crowd of everybody cheering after Fred and George leave and Hermione sees and looks down at him and then Harry explains to Ron and Hermione like he's got Sirius, he's got him. Um, he's gonna kill him. And then I love the scene at the staircase where Ron and Hermione are like, but don't but don't you like don't rush into this. Don't you think that maybe he's putting these these uh, images in your mind to try to bring you in and then Harry says well what if he does Hermione he's the only family I've got left I've got to go pr save him and then they go to Umbridge's um, chimney because that's the only one not under surveillance uh, for the flu network and then Harry and Harry's gonna go to Grimmel Place and talk to Sirius but Umbridge breaks right in at the moment and then she traps Harry and, like, ties him up and starts smacking him and, like, saying, you were going to Dumbledore, weren't you? Like, the flu network. And Harry says no, and she just slaps him all over. And she gets Snape and says, Snape, the time has come. Now I need your bird to see him now than ever. And then Snape just says, but you used all of my bird to see him uh, on all the students interrogating them and last with Miss Chang. So Cho Chang was innocent. She just had... Like, the truth serum she drank, so then she said the truth. Um, it just... And, like, I like that little hint that, like, oh, she didn't just betray them. She was blackmailed into it. But then I love the fact that Snape's about to walk away, and Sna and Harry just says, he's got Padfoot. He's got Padfoot at the place where it's hidden. And then Umber says, Padfoot, Padfoot, what is he talking about, Snape? And then she just looks at him, and Snape just goes no idea and he just walks away even though that's why later like you realize what the like how the ending is made up because Snape goes and warns everybody because he is part of the Order of the Phoenix so I really like that and I and I love that moment where like Snape knows what it is but he he's very coy he's Snape so I really like that um and then I love how Umbridge is so far 
of a horrible person where she says like, well, if you're not going to tell me where it is, or where how Dumbledore is, then the Cruciatus curse might uh, open your tongue. And then Hermione just says, that's illegal. And then she just says, what Cornelius doesn't know won't hurt him. Uh, what Fudge won't know. So she's about to torture Harry. Literally use the, one of the three unforgivable curses on Harry. And then Hermione screams, tell him, Harry. Or tell her, Harry. And Umbridge says, tell me what? Um, and then Hermione says, well, if you're not going to tell her, then I will. And then Umbridge says, tell me what? And then... Or what is. And then Hermione says, Dumbledore's secret weapon. And then she she and Harry, Umbridge, Umbridge, Harry, and Hermione go out into the woods where Hermione is improvising because, of course, there's no secret weapon Dumbledore has. And they go out into the woods and they trick it. They trick her to where there's centaurs out there who are all raging because of the ministry and blocking off their territory. Um... So the centaurs are out there, and Umbridge, of course, calls an Umbridge and or calls a centaur a, a half breed, um, chokes one out, and Hermione just screams, "Stop it, please, stop it!" And then Umbridge is like, "No, no, I won't. I I will have order." And then like Grop comes up and just grabs Umbridge, and. That that gives a chance for Harry and Hermione to escape while the centaurs take away Umbridge. Like, they literally take her away. And, and Umbridge, before she leaves, this is a great payoff, but before she leaves, she says to Harry, Potter, tell him I need no harm. And then Harry just says, I'm sorry, Professor, but I must not tell lies. And then she gets taken away by the centaurs. And then they're happy that she's gone, but then they're all like, Harry's like, Hermione's serious. So then they're running really fast, and then they meet up with Luna, Ginny, and Neville, and Ron, and they all go on the Thestrals to go to the Ministry of Magic, where they're trying to find this item that Voldemort didn't have the last time, which kept being explained throughout the movie. He, there's something he needs. So they all go on Thestral to the Ministry of Magic. And whenever they get there, they've got... Like they, Harry figures out what the item is, and it's the it's this orb that is a prophecy, the prophecy of what Trelawney says too. Like she's the one who talks in the prophecy, saying like um, the prophecy of them being equals, Harry and Voldemort, and that neither can live while the other survives. And he hears this, and the Death Eaters appear, like Lucius Malfoy, um, Bellatrix, all these other people all these other Death Eaters appear, and we have this great action scene. Like, the action is really awesome in this, where um, before it happens, Lucius asks for the prophecy from Harry, and Harry just says, I've waited 14 years. And then Lucius says, I know. And then Harry just says, I guess I'll have to wait a bit, a bit longer. Now! And then, like, they start running away. They run through all this big area of all these different orbs, just buildings and buildings upon orbs, just... Uh, prophecies everywhere um they're running through and they have this great moment where Ginny launches a curse and like it's where every one of these built these literal building sized orbs uh towers of orbs start falling down so they're being run out of that while the death eaters are chasing after them they fall through a door float down to a bottom area and then they find this empty archway and Harry can hear a voice, voices coming from it, and Luna can too, but nobody else can. So it does connect to death. Um, so they hear this through the atrium. They just hear, like, the voices. And then, as this happens, Sirius and the Order appear and fight. Like, Tonks, Mad-Eye Moody, Kingsley, everybody. Uh, um, they all appear, and they all fight. Um, they all fight each other. And then we get to the most, one of the most heartbreaking scenes in the whole franchise and in the books, too, where Sirius Black comes to his rescue with everybody else, and then Bellatrix uses the killing curse on him and kills him, and then he goes through the atrium that Harry just heard the voices from, floats right through, and dies. And then that moment... And this is silent, too. It's just a score, but there's no sound of the screaming because apparently the Daniel Radcliffe screams were too hard to listen to in terms of, like, they were so realistically 
hard to listen to because it felt like he actually did lose a person, but whenever Harry screams, his screams are silent, and then there's just that incredible score. He loses Sirius. He loses the only family he's got left. He goes up to Bellatrix, uses the Cruciatus curse on her, but then she acts like she's hurt, but then nothing's wrong, and then Voldemort appears out of, out of thin air and says to Harry, like, do it, Harry. She deserves it. Um, and then he said, you got to mean it. Because, like, the Cruciatus curse didn't do much because he didn't fully mean it. He want, he was just angry in the moment. But then Voldemort appears. And then I love how he taunts Harry. And then right out of the, right after this, Dumbledore appears. And we've got the fantastic fight, one of the coolest fights in the whole franchise, uh, where... Dumbledore and Voldemort have that epic fight. Bellatrix escapes. All the Death Eaters escape. Voldemort has this battle with Voldemort, where, or with Dumbledore, where it's just this incredible battle. And Im with the imagery, too, it's incredible. Like, there's things where Voldemort will break all these glass, make all the glass come and fly through him while, Voldemort, while Dumbledore will have a shield covering him and the glass will turn into sand, like, or dust. And just, it's just an incredible action moment, an incredible epic scene of them fighting. Um, but then, as the fight ends, Harry gets literally possessed by Voldemort. Like, he becomes possessed where Harry, Voldemort talking through Harry, says, You've lost, old man, to Dumbledore. And then I love, again, this is just one of the best moments in the whole franchise where he says... Like, Harry is possessed, tortured. He keeps seeing scenes of, like, throughout the whole movie and the other movies. And Harry's screaming in agony. And Dumbledore, talking to the half-possessed Harry, says, like, um, Harry, it isn't how you... It isn't how you are alike. It's how you're different. And it just... It literally makes... Chokes me up. And then... You see then Harry showing, instead of his nightmare, showing all the happy times he's had with everybody. With Sirius, with Ron, Hermione, with everybody. And then I love the way he defeats Voldemort in this movie where he says to Voldemort, who's possessing him, like, you're the weak one. And you'll never know love or friendship. And I feel sorry for you. And that takes Voldemort out of him. To where Voldemort appears out again uh, instead of possessing Harry. But right whenever all everybody from the ministry comes start start to appear all from all the chimneys, uh, from all the fireplaces, they all start appearing, and Fudge sees Voldemort, and finally is convinced after all this shit that he did in through the whole movie with Umbridge doing everything, he's finally convinced that Dumbledore wasn't a liar, that he's back, he's finally back, so just such a great ending, such a great ending. Um, I I love that. I love how the orders appear and, and he escapes. That's just so great. Um, and then everything goes back to normal in a series of newspaper clippings, which this does a good job, this movie, of having, uh, like, instead of omitting some stuff, they do it to where it's, like, in newspaper form on the screen where it, like, shows different things happening at once through papers, through the Daily Prophet, and showing how Umbridge is sacked. She's gone from Hogwarts now. Um... Everybody, like, the truth about Voldemort is out. Everybody knows he's back. Um, so everything goes back to normal. And I love the moment where Harry is, cl like, like Dumbledore has a talk with Harry in his office, and he says, I know how you feel, Harry. And Harry just says, no, you don't. Because he just lost his godfather. He lost the last person who was his family. And then Dumbledore explains what, throughout the whole movie, we had been wondering, and throughout the whole book, we had been wondering why was Dumbledore distancing himself from Harry. But then you realize that's what happened, because at the end of the movie, when Harry's possessed, that's what Voldemort wanted. He wanted to possess Harry. Um, so Dumbledore said to Harry, like, he apologizes. He thought that he was trying to distance himself, and that would keep him protected from Voldemort uh, trying to take him over. Um... And then Harry, Harry talks to Dumbledore and says, like, so I heard that he heard the prophecy and said, and it said, like, one has to kill the other. One can't live while the other survives. Is that all true? And then Dumbledore says, 
It is. And then he says that he didn't tell him because of all the torture he's had throughout his life so far. Why would he want to hurt him anymore? And, he, and Dumbledore says how much Harry means to him. That why would he want to hurt him anymore? So he kept the truth about the ones got to live while the other survives and like keeping him at a distance this year like ever like those scenes those last couple scenes with Dumbledore and Harry are incredible it's so sad and so moving um he, cuz Dumbledore out of love kept the try to keep pain away from Harry like tried not to tell him the truth it's really good um so i love those scenes and i love the final scene with Luna and Harry where Luna gives him advice about that that all these kids keep like taking her shoes and make fun making fun of her and Harry's like that's horrible and she goes oh it's all in good fun but since it's the last night I really need them back and then she explains or then she says I'm so sorry about your godfather Harry and then she grabs his hand for a second and then says how you know some things are never truly lost and like it cuts up and then there's her shoes on top of this pedestal and she's and she just kind of smiles and goes I think I'll have some pudding and then go then skips away but it's just such a great final moment with Luna and Harry too and then we get to the end where they're getting on the train and I love how we have that line where Harry's talking to everybody where he says after the line where he says like you'll never know love or friendship earlier he says at the end to everybody else like we do, even though we have a big fight coming, we have one thing that Voldemort doesn't have. And they said, what? And he says, well, each other. And it ends on that note, like, like it's going to be horrible going forward, like what's going to happen, but at least they've got each other no matter what. Like, Voldemort doesn't have true friends or family. He's got supporters. He's got people who he tells what to do. Not real friends, not real family. And that is what makes Harry better. So... So I love how it ended, and I just, it's weird, every single one of these movies, I love every one more than the other one, even though they're all fantastic. I thought Goblet of Fire was one of the best ones, and it is, but man, watching Order of the Phoenix again, like, every human moment with Harry, and with everything about the story, everything about the action, everything about the plot, like, this just is so incredible, and I love every minute of it, like the other ones. So this one just blew me away again, and I'm so, so glad I got to talk about it. So if you stayed this long, thank you. This this is it's an honor. Thank you for doing that. So if you did, thanks for watching so much. And next up, I will talk about Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. So thanks so much for watching, and stay tuned for that.